First of all, I want to make this very, very clear. I am not a judge over here. And there is no debate happening. For some reason, they put me in the middle. But it's okay, inshallah ta'ala. Alhamdulillah, by for a good cause, inshallah azza wa jal. Tonight, our uh, uh, discussion is going to be on a very interesting topic, and I don't think anybody will explain, explain it uh, better than uh, Sheikh Abdullah Uduru, my friend, Zalla Khair, our uh, uh, neighbor, the Imam of uh, uh, Islamic Center of Kopel. Uh, so, uh, and we're very happy and thankful uh, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bring you to us here this evening, Sheikh Nabiqatakum Allah, Barakallah, Fikum, inshallah. So, as usual, we discuss from the book of uh, uh, Ibn al Jawzi, Rahimahullah, Ta'ala, Sayyid al Khatar, Captured Thoughts. And we're going to go into this chapter, inshallah ta'ala. I'm going to go over this, the topic quickly, and then we will open for discussion and Q&A, inshallah ta'ala, afterwards, bin Allah azza wa jal. So Imam ibn, ibn al-Jawzi, rahimahullah ta'ala, if you guys remember, last night we were talking about what? Do you guys remember? What was last night's topic? Angels versus humans, right? And before that, we were talking about why the dua is being delayed and the struggles we have to go through uh, uh, dealing with all these uh, struggles and, and trials and so on. So today, or tonight, today, today, it's actually 1 a.m. So how do you strengthen yourself? Okay, I know I have to go through all these difficulties. I know I need to struggle to go upstream instead of, you know, going downward. I know I can't be an angel, meaning I cannot be a perfect person. But I can do something about, you know, trying to reach certain human perfection. The question over here is how? On that road, on the road to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, on that journey to Allah azza wa jalla, how can I make myself strong enough to endure all the hardships and trials that I go through? That's the meaning of the chapter, inshallah ta'ala. And Imam al Jawzi, rahimahullah, he began with an interesting thing. He goes, look, he, st- he talks about a story, and that's a real story that he actually, he, uh, which shows us, subhanAllah, a window to their time and to their lifestyle back then. He goes, Marra bi hammalan, says, uh, one day I was walking, and I came by two people, two workers, laborers, who were carrying uh, uh, timber or lumber, or, or actually a trunk of a tree. It must be heavy, of course. What they were doing as they were carrying that, that, that piece of wood, it's so heavy, and as they were walking, they were exchanging chantings, you know, kind of like chanting songs and uh, maybe probably poetry or something like that. To, to bring themselves, you know, to, to ease, to endure the hardships of the labor that they were working. They were kind of chanting songs to each other and kind of like trying to pass time with each other and so on. قال فأحدهما يصغي إلى ما يقوله الآخر So one of them is singing a part. قال ثم يعيده ويجيبه مثله Then the other person, he repeats that and answers with his own line. So they kind of like exchanging all these lines. قال والآخر همته مثل ذلك And the other person does exactly the same thing. So one is saying something and the other one responds to him. And then the other person says something, the other one responds to him. In chanting mode and of course in, in, uh, with their beautiful voices. فَقَالْ فَرَأَيْتُ أَنَّهُمَا لَوْ لَمْ يَفْعَلَ هَذَا زَادَتِ الْمَشَقَّةُ عَلَيْهِمَا He said, I thought about this. So by the way, very interesting thing to us today. I mean, how come these ulama, they see anecdotes and everything around them? I mean, two, two random guys doing their own, minding their own business. And this sheikh is looking at us, he goes like, wow, that's an interesting thing. He goes, قَالَ فَتَأَمَّلْتُ فَتَأَمَّلْتُ السَّبَبُ He said, قَالَ فَرَأَيْتُ أَنَّهُمْ لَوْ لَمْ يَفْعَلَ هَذَا زَارَةِ الْمَشَقَّةُ عَلَيْهِمَا So I was thinking about this, I was contemplating over this. I thought to myself, if they didn't do that, if they did not try to pass the time with this, he goes, it will be actually, it will feel heavier on them. It will be even more difficult for them to endure that. وَثَقُلَ الْأَمْرُ وَكُلَّمَا فَعَلَ هَذَا هَانَ الْأَمْرَ And every time they, try, they do that, we exchange these chants, it gets easier for them. And they find that the time goes by so quickly. قَالَ فَتَأَمَّلْتُ السَّبَبَ فِي ذَلَكَ I was thinking about what could be the reason behind that. فَإِذَا بِهِ تَعْلِيقُ فِكْرِ كُلِّ وَاحِدٍ مِّنْهُمَا بِمَا يَقُولُهُ الْآخَرِ Because I found out that everybody, each one of them, is waiting in anticipation to what the other is going to reply to him. So he said, like, when I say something, now my himma, my concern is about how is he going to reply to this? So now you distract yourself, he's saying. قال, به, and each one of them is enjoying the chanting of the other person. And his mind is busy right now preparing the refutation or the, the, the rebuttal to what he's listening to. فقال, الطريق, and as a result, we pass through the, the, the road, and we forget about the weight we're carrying over our shoulders. 
Like no one really paid attention to that. فأخذت من هذا إشارة عجيبة. So I got from this an interesting thing, like an interesting, you know, symbolic thing from their from their behavior. ورأيت الإنسان قد حمل من التكليف أمور صعبة. And I looked at what the insan, human beings, are carrying, the load they're carrying right now in terms of their taklif, what Allah subhanahu made obligatory upon them, what ibadah they're supposed to be observing, and so forth. قال فحمل من التكليف أمور صعبة, heavy load, difficult matters. ومن ومن أثقل ما ومن أثقل ما حمل and our the heaviest thing that the insan had to deal with قال مدارات نفسه how to how do you say the word مدارة over here kind of like saying you kind of like trying to help your your nafs go by without focusing on the load and the heavy weight that's carrying it's more like a distract, how to distract yourself from the, from the burden of this taklif while benefiting from it overall. So he says, Qala, wa taklifuha bis sabri amma tuhib. He says, and also trying to make my nafs endure the hardships of dealing uh, with the patience to stay away from what it desires, obviously. Qala wa kullu ala ma takrah, and also to endure the hardship of doing what it hates and dislikes. That he's talking about, over, of course, the ibadat and also staying away from the muharramat. He brought a, a, a line of poetry over here. قَالَ فَرَأَيْتُ الصَّوَابَ قَطْعُ طَرِيقِ التَّصَبْرِ بِالتَّسْلِيَةِ وَالطَّلَطُ فِي الْنَفْسِ He said, I found out then, in order for me to survive all of this, the best way to do that is helping our nafs to go through the road to Allah, the journey to Allah Azza wa Jal, by doing the same thing. Finding that bringing some ease to my nafs while, I'm, uh, while it's going through all these hardships. How can I bring ease to my nafs while going through all these hardships? And he mentioned a line of poetry. فَإِن تَشَكَّتْ فَعَلِّلْهَا الْمَجَرَّةَ مِنْ ضَوْءِ الصَّبَاحِ وَعِدْهَا بِالْرَوَاحِ ضُحَى He said, said, if your nafs starts complaining about the darkness of the night, like the night is being too long, then kind of like persuade your nafs, talk to your nafs, tell her, look, المجرّة, which means these stars, that's a sign that the morning is very close, even though it's not probably. But like you see the light up there, that the light of the, of the, in the horizon was not the, the Fajr light, it's actually the night uh, uh, light from the stars. That means the morning is so close. And the nafs will endure that, of course, long length of that journey because now the anticipation of the morning is very close to her. قال وعدها بالرواح ضحى And tell your nafs that we're going to be traveling very soon. We're going to be arriving there very, very soon. So this is the, 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 the introduction to it, Shaykh. Now, before we move on to some of the statements, if you would like to make any comments on this, inshallah, and then we ask Shaykh Abdullah, inshallah, to give his uh, input here. Jazakallah khair, Shaykh. So, um, I, I, you know, subhanAllah, as you're going through these things, the idea of, I think, to put a modern day example to it, which is what came to my mind. Obviously, if you go on a long trip, if you've ever been on a long trip where you sing songs to each other, you have something where this, this group will sing one line and the other group will sing one line. Uh, it's actually a very profound way to actually pass time. So if you think about that growing up on the field trips, uh, I know when you take the Hajj groups, the bake Allahumma the bake, it's like when everyone's really excited at the Miqat when you're first starting in Medina, and then 10 minutes later, all you hear is and then you got that one guy that wakes up every 30 minutes and goes, <laughs> and then, you know, so, so it's like you got to get everybody, get the harakah going once again in the bus, right? Come on, y'all, like get the, the bake Allah, the bake. So you got that one person that's got to get the group going. And then you have the really overzealous person every once in a while who just lights the whole, every time people start falling asleep, you just start screaming, the bake Allah, the bake, and wakes everybody up. Um, that's one way. And subhanAllah, you know what I was thinking about, Sheikh, also? is even when they were building the khandaq, no. the ansar oh, were singing totally. to each other. Mm. They were doing ashids to each other. The most no. difficult moment, they're facing a genocide, right? They're facing a genocide, but they're singing to each other as they are digging the trenches to, to, to also, not just to pass time, but it had meaning to it. It's also part of the, the power of it is that they weren't just singing empty songs that they could think of. They had meaning to it. And I think of some of my fondest trips, subhanAllah, when I go on a long trip with, with certain brothers and we'll sing nasheeds on the way. You know, nasheeds that we know. It's, it's a way to really build a bond and to uh, pass with one another. But as you go forth, I think the point that he's making here is a very profound one, which is connected deeply to what we spoke about yesterday, that our arwah, our souls, are carrying the a'ba al-ajsam. They're carrying the abaya, the, the clothing of the body, right? Mm. The, the burden of the body. And so it's just like the example that he gave 
uh, that we spoke about yesterday, that the soul has to take care of the body the way that a rider has to take care of the camel. And he gives the example of Yom Tarwiya, give it some rest, you know, before you go into the days of Hajj. And so uh, the idea here that you don't neglect the self, but you keep on telling the self just a little longer, just a little longer, just a little longer, right? And keep telling it, there's something else coming. Push yourself a little bit further, push yourself a little bit further, push yourself a little bit further. And I'm sure, Sheikh Abdullah, you can comment on this in the gym. I would come with you if you would sing to me when we would work out. I think I could lift the same amount of weight as you if you just said, if you started to sing to me, I think we'd be able to get through, through it together. But. Is it true, Sheikh? Can, can you do that? Sing to Sheikh Omar? I'll join with him. <laughs> Bismillah, let's do it. When, when, you, when, you're, when, you're try, when you're working out, when you're exercising, when you're trying to get to that next step, right? What do you tell yourself when you feel like you're about to give in? And if there's someone that's spotting you, that pushes you, right? Isn't it easier? Yes. So, it's, so it's, this is this physical thing, obviously, which transforms, of course, the symbolic thing of the, of the nafs as well, too. Nah. No, no doubt. I mean, definitely, uh, um, it's definitely the physical. You know, I remember one of my mentors was telling me just how you look is just a byproduct of of really the internal. You know, mentally you have to tell yourself that you can do it and you just start to, you just gotta zone out. I mean, even when, you know, doing anything in fitness or even, you know, eating, you have to zone out and see what you want. Right? Mm. What do you want from this? And uh, a lot of times uh, it's just me zoning out and thinking, okay, if I'm picking this up or if I gotta go an extra mile, I just, okay, I'm trying to, there's a rock that's on my daughter's leg and I'm the only one that can get it off. Mm. You know, and I have to, there's no, there's no, other, there's no choice. You know, subhanAllah. I remember it was, it was uh, speaking of Hajj, uh, I was there at the, during the stampede. It was a stampede, I think it was 2006. And you don't even, you didn't even realize it was happening until all of a sudden they called the Adhan of Luhr and you see people doing this and like, man, man. And they're, they're, they're screaming, you know, the Adhan's going off because that's when you can start to throw the, the Jamarat. And you don't hear what they're saying and all of a sudden it's just a stampede. I remember my leg got caught and then I said to myself, okay, I better keep going. If I don't, I'm going to be run over by hundreds of people. So I literally just pulled my leg out. I didn't know what was going to happen to my leg, if it was going to come with me or not. So you just got to think about those moments and say, okay, you know, I got to push it. I'm at that last point. If I give up, I'm always going to say to myself, I could have done a little more. No. And just knowing that making that effort, inshallah, you will get to the next stage. And that's literally even an act from your anatomy and as, as a muscle or your mind. You have to take it to that next point. to where your mind is telling you, no, just relax. You say, no, keep going. Just take it one more step. You'll be so grateful after you do it. Beautiful. SubhanAllah. That ties into the, the next story, actually, or the chapter. Continuing that chapter when he, uh, Imam Ibn al-Jawzi, rahimahullah, brought the story of Bishr al-Hafi, rahimahullah ta'ala. One of the righteous predecessors in the past, he says, qala, uh, Bishr al-Hafi yuhka anhu. There's a story about him. Was traveling. They were traveling on the road. And back then, the road is not like ours, mashallah, you have all these fancy, you know, gas stations to stop and get some rest and so forth. It, it's, it's a dangerous journey. When you go, you might not even come back at all. You might die on the road, subhanAllah. So he says, قَالَ فَسَارَ وَمَعْهُ رَجُلٌ فِي طريق. They went on a, on a, road, on a road trip. فَعَطِشَ صَاحِبُهُ His companion got a little bit thirsty. فَقَالَ لَهُ نَشْرَبُ مِنْ هَذَا الْبِئْرِ So the man told Bishr al-Hafi, can we stop to get a drink from this water well? فَبِشْرُ الْحَافِي, he told him, قَالَ Isbir il al al He says, be patient, let's go to the next one. We'll be okay, but we'll get to the next one. We'll drink at the next one. Falamma wasala ilayha, when they arrived at the next water well or water station, Bishr al Hafi again tells his companion, he goes, How about we wait for the next one? Let's wait for the next one. And then he kept doing that. Every time he kept distracting him from his want or his need to drink that water right now, and from that water well. He kept delaying him and kept basically kind of asking him to postpone the fulfillment of his need in that moment. Qala, then finally Bishr al-Hafi looked at his companion, he goes, you see, hakada tanqati'ud dunya. This is how you can go through this dunya. Like this is how you can go through this life. Every time your nafs is desiring something and you just go follow that instinct right away, uh, you will never go anywhere. Because your nafs, like we learned earlier, your nafs always try to take you, of course, downstream. Your nafs always wants to push downstream. But we've been learning all these past nights is that you need to try to strengthen your muscles going upstream, obviously. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be difficult. So how can I do this? Distraction sometimes works very well, as in this example. And Sheikh, you were talking about road trips, right? The lines of poetry, exchange amongst yourself and so on. 
I remember we used to spend uh, our, our road trips as well the same way. And sometimes, all we need, especially with the kids, obviously, you to distract them with what? With, for example, playing uh, uh, I Spy, right? I Spy this, I Spy this. We spend hours playing I Spy just to try to spot things in the car, subhanAllah. And by the time we're done with the game, we probably maybe cross 200 miles. So the same thing, the same kind. I'm sure you have this experience as well too, Shaykhna. But this concept itself, what Ibish al Hafi was talking about, uh, 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 he's saying that, look, if you want to really to uh, uh, reach your destination, then don't stop, too, don't, don't have too, too many frequent stops on the way. What does that mean? Yeah, SubhanAllah. Again, it's just saying that, you know, we can go a little more. We can go a little more. You know that it's not going to be easy to reach that destination. I mean, we think about it. Many of us are in school. We went to college. You know, you've had to keep going. There's a point to where you're just, you're, you're pushed to a limit. And sometimes you say, Meta Nasrullah, right? It's like, when is the help going to come? And you just take it that extra step. And you're so grateful for it. And, you know, being distracting, I remember you were talking about now in the mornings, you know, I take my son and my daughter to school. Mm. And uh, are you familiar with beatboxing? Any of you know what beatboxing is? Yeah, we know beatboxing. Yeah. You want me to do it right now? <laughs> That's it's, epic. Like, it's we're not, it's we're not, tonight, I'm not that man. old, man. Not that old. <laughs> I remember SubhanAllah, I was in Medina, man. It was so funny. My wife's going to kill me, but it's okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we were driving to, to Jubail, and I was explaining to her, like, how, what beatboxing was. And she was like, la, abadin, la, 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 la. It's like, there's no way you So then, I just bear with me. I did it real quick. She was like, a'udhu billah. A'udhu billah. And I just started laughing so hard. But we don't beat box a lot, but I do it with my kids in the car. We just do like, a, you do a, it's called a, like a dad joke bar session. So I like, you're dropping, you know what dropping bars are? <laughs> you know? Why talk to me, talk to him about it. <laughs> He's not cool, we've established that already. His dad jokes are just his. So I fit the dad jokes? I fit the dad jokes, he doesn't? Is that what you, I fit the dad jokes, he doesn't, I fit that? Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> So I'll just say, a lot, I'll, I'll drop a line, like I'll say, uh, go into the store. And then my set, it's funny, my nine-year-old is the most talented. My mm. daughter's going to hate me, but he's the one, he has the most, like the subject. Like if I say, go into the store, he only has a couple of seconds, he said, and I really want more. And then my daughter's going to say, the sky's a galore. And whoever takes too long, you're out. Interesting. So by the time we get to school, there's a winner. You know, mm. it's usually dad, I'll be honest, saying, you know, <laughs> No, but that really passes the time, and alhamdulillah, you know, in the morning, a lot of times they're, they're, they're like, you know, full of anguish and tired, so when I just kind of pick them up, you know, and do that, it kind of passes the time, inshallah. So, it's the same kind of concept, alhamdulillah. Shaykhna Ibn Ibn al-Jawzi, rahmatullah ta'ala, he elaborates on this principle of distracting the self until it gets to the destination. He goes, وَمَنْ فَهِمَ هَذَا الْأَصْلَ عَلَّ النَّفْسَ وَتَلَطَّفَ بِهَا If you truly understand this principle, this, this concept about your own self, that even your own self needs to be distracted, needs to be given opportunities like this, like giving, a, giving yourself a hope, delayed response from those needs, because it's more rewarding when you wait a little bit longer, he goes. قال, and took it easy with yourself, instead of always pushing yourself, uh, or at least always follow your love, yourself where, where, where it wants to go. قال, الجميل, and you keep giving yourself uh, the promise that the reward for waiting is better. If you always keep reminding yourself, wait, it's going to be better. قال, لتصبر على ما قد حملت, so that we'd be in, able to endure all these, all these loads that she's carrying, or the nafs that's carrying. قال, كما كان بعض الصلف يقول نفسه. Just like some of the self prize brothers and sisters used to say uh, to themselves when they speak to themselves. And that's what we call it muhasaba, right? It's more of like self-auditing. You talk to yourself. You have that self-talk every now and then. Just like when you talk to somebody at the gym, when you start talking to Sheikh Omar to lift higher, right? And, and, and have your look. Same thing, you talk to yourself, that kind of self-talk, you do it as well. You're telling yourself, قال, وَاللَّهِ مَا أُرِيدُ بِمَنْعِكِ مِنْ هَذَا الَّذِي تُحِبِّينَ إِلَّا الْإِشْفَاقَ عَلَيْكِ He says, look, the only reason I'm preventing you from following what you desire is because it's my fear for your safety. I'm looking after you. It's not because I want to prevent you from enjoying what you, what you like to do, but I, want, I would like for me to enjoy further, but maybe not now. And in the last... Uh, statement he says he وقال أبو يزيد رحمه الله تعالى ما زلت أسوق نفسي إلى الله تعالى وهي تبكي حتى سقطها وهي تضحك 
I was, قال, سبحان الله, he says, قال, ما زلت أسوق نفسي. I, I kept driving myself to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forcefully while my nafs is crying. Why is crying? Because my nafs is feeling that I'm depriving, my, uh, depriving it from what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, uh, you know, uh, permissible probably even or haram here. And it's crying because it's unable to fulfill these desires. He says, I kept doing this to myself until my nafs came to the uh, conclusion that this is for its own, of course, good. And when I do that, my nafs is just happy with it. It's smiling, it's laughing. Because now my nafs recognizes the, the reward for, for waiting. And you should understand that distracting yourself and being nice to yourself and being easy with yourself in that manner. In this way, you can go through the journey without feeling, of course, the burden of that journey. And that just uh, uh, kind of like bringing, bringing it to your attention. And has a long explanation to go through. This is, subhanAllah, one of the deepest concepts in the religion. One of the deepest concepts in the religion. Of course. And if you study uh, theology and you study other religious systems, this is one of the most you know, beautiful elements of our deen. When do we do Eid? After a sacrifice. After Sliyam and after sacrifice. No. Our two celebrations come after an act of worship. And the ulama talk about this in so many different ways with so many different dimensions. We are supposed to push ourselves with tears in these last few nights of Ramadan. As if we're not going to be forgiven by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya Allah, forgive me and pushing ourselves. But on the day of Eid, that's a preview of Jannah. Come out, khudu zinatakum, and the kudi masjid is multiplied by so much more. Go to, the, go to your Salatul Eid wearing your best clothes, embrace one another, celebrate one another, with one another. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, La ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, walillah, alhamd. There's a celebration, right? At that point, what do you find from the Salaf who have such fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and were crying their eyes out in those 10 nights in ways that they had not been crying before? Laughter, joy, celebration, singing. And then you find in, uh, if, how many of you have been to Hajj? Just a show of hands. May Allah write down for each and every single person in this masjid, Hajjul Mabrur. Allahumma ameen. 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 And everyone that's watching as well. Allahumma ameen. 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 SubhanAllah, you go to Hajj, you finish the day of Arafah. Those of you that have been will understand exactly what I'm talking about. When you finish that day of dua, and you've probably cried more in those six hours or seven hours than you have for the whole year and exerted yourself in dua, the hugs with people that you've only known for 10 days, the hugs, when you come out of ihram then, after doing the hard stuff, because there's always like Eid 1.0 and 2.0 for the Hijaj, right? It's like you finish Arafah and you feel like amazing, you feel like you've just, you know, expelled all of these sins from your life and there's a joy there. And then you go to Musdalif and it's like, hey, we're not done yet. We still got, you know, a lot to go here. And then after the ihram comes off and, uh, you know, in, in our group, Shaykh, we do a ihram burning. No, we don't burn our ihram, for real. It's like, <laughs> but it's like, just throw, get that, you know, the ihram you've been wearing. Black He's black black. <laughs> you know, but like, it's after you're done with the ihram and you never want to see that thing again, right? It's like so, you know, it's just oh sweaty God. and nasty and, you know, subhanAllah, but Man, there's I still have my ihram from years ago. MashaAllah. Can you not bring that one on this year, Shaykh? <laughs> I don't know how that is. And that was, you know. No. But, but on a serious note, subhanAllah, think about the celebration that comes. You're not supposed to be holding your head down like, did Allah accept my hajj? Did Allah accept my Ramadan? At that no. point, you're celebrating. So Allah gives you previews of Jannah. And subhanAllah, those of you that have come out of ihram and, and after hajj, like it feels like a celebration of entering into a new realm, into a new presence. And that's a preview as well in Ramadan. So think of the opposite way. You know, we often talk about Lisa'ani Farhatan, the very profound Hadith Qudsi, uh, that for the fasting person, or the, the Hadith of the Messenger وسلم, for the fasting person is two forms of joy. The joy when they break their fast and the joy when they meet their Lord. So we often talk about, hey, look, the joy that you feel when you break your fast is you know, just a preview, right? But the real joy is when you meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? What if Allah Azza wa didn't give us iftar and the dua of iftar? Like confirming, Ya Allah, with my husn al the, the good deeds have been written down. The good deeds have been written down by the night. What if Allah did not give us Eid? What if we didn't have this, this, this celebration element? 
you know, and what does that look like on a daily basis? When your good deeds make you happy and your bad deeds make you sad. You're a believer. That means your iman is there. That means your heart is alive. The joy that you feel when you finish a good deed and how Allah Azza invites us. And what is, what is, and this is something, subhanAllah, I was actually getting in my khutbah, now I gotta think of another khutbah, but I'll just do it now. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's like we're lecture after lecture, right? But I was thinking about this and it only occurred to me today. What do you say as soon as you're saying, labayk Allahumma labayk, labayk Allahumma labayk, labayk la sharika laka labayk, until the end of it, the tarbiyah, right? Here I come, here I come, O oh Allah. And then on the day of Eid in Hajj, here I come, O oh Allah, which is an expression of qurb, coming closer to Allah. As soon as you stone that shaitan, the whole chant just switches. So you see the people doing talbiyah going, and then you see the people leaving, and it's a beautiful like transition. It's like the wave, the wave of people going to Jamrat al aqaba saying, here we come, stone the shaitan. You know, uh, the Egyptians with a little bit extra emphasis when they're stoning the shaitan, yeah? <laughs> and then you, you leave the jamra, and then it's Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, right? Takbirat, like there's a triumph there. And what happens to us when we finish these nights of Allahumma inna ka afu and tuhibbu al-afu fa'afu anni? Ten nights of crying, ten nights of seeking forgiveness. There's a, tr a feeling of triumph in Eid, right? Like shaitan's coming back out from his chains. By the way, we have strength in ourselves, bi'idhnillahi ta'ala, to where we're not going to let certain habits come back into our lives. We're not giving you the same space that you used to occupy in our lives. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. La ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Walillah alhamd. So that triumph eases the journey along the way. Because we talked about the mountaintop. And to get to the mountaintop, it helps to know, I got five miles down. Alhamdulillah, let me take a break. Let's celebrate five miles. We're halfway there. The, the, the nature of al-insan, we're halfway there. All right, what's the next step? What's the next step? Hatta idha balagha ashuddahu wa balagha arba'ina sana. Right? Allah Azza wa even mentions these marahil, these age, milestones of age. Like you take a step back and say, Alhamdulillah, okay, I'm here now. Alhamdulillah. What's the next step? What's the next step? What's the next step? Until we have the ultimate ease, bi'idhnillahi ta'ala, the ultimate well, not just the wells along the way, the held of our Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam arriving at his held. May Allah Azza wa allow us to arrive together. Allahumma ameen. Arriving at his held and drinking from his hand sallallahu alaihi wasallam like, I made it. I made it. Right. That's the ultimate well that you look for, and the little wells along the way, they sustain the nafs. They sustain that that self to let it know, hey, it's okay. You're getting there. You're getting there. You're making progress. You're making progress. You're making progress. Zakallah Sheikh. Yeah. So, Sheikh, I want to repeat what Sheikh Omar mentioned here. It's interesting in regards to the theological concept in almost every religion that in order for people to endure the hardships of the ibadah, they have to think and imagine what? The delayed response to it, the delayed reward. That there is reward for this. Yeah, it's hard right now, but if you wait an hour or two or a year or, or, or lifetime, your reward is, will be way beyond you know, what you expect today. And I remember uh, two things. One, uh, there's, a, there's a, an experiment, I think maybe all of us heard about it, the marshmallows experiment with kids, with little kids. When you give little kids, you know, the, the chance to take one marshmallow right now to eat, okay, or wait five minutes, you get two. Now, if I ask you this question, guys, who would say, I will take the one because it's sure for me right now? I don't want to wait for the five minutes to take two because I might not even have it. What could happen between now and the five minutes, for example, the end of the five minutes? We have all these anxieties, all these worries, all these, you know, expectations. So some of us might say, no, 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 I'd rather actually take the one marshmallow now because it's for sure it's certain. I worry about the other one next time, inshallah ta'ala. Some people, this is how they treat their akhirah as well too. Like, look, I mean, Allah promised me pleasure in the akhirah, right? There's this, there's this, there's that. But this is here now. You know, uh, this is certain. This is, I don't know, I'm, I'm not really sure. But their iman is very weak. So if we want to... Look at it from that perspective. What should we tell our brothers and sisters in regards to helping them strengthen this principle, this theological principle? Look, to wait for the reward in itself is much more rewarding. What do we need to do to start strengthening our iman and that delayed reward versus just go downstream with our nafs and follow the desires quickly? It is really knowing the reward. I mean, really, really, really knowing the reward and having an acquaintance with it. Understanding what it is, reading about it, like when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about Jannah, like what is Jannah and really why do I want Jannah? Why should it matter to me as a human being? And then the whole concept of taklif. Taklif means 
responsibility. Mm -hmm. There's a level of even some scholars say, kallafa yukallifu is a level of stress. So you have to have that level of stress to move on to the next level. And that's anything in life. If we just take a step back and see the things that I've earned, there was a level of hardship and there was a point to where I didn't want to continue. But the fact that I continued, mm -hmm. that got me to that point to where I look back and I say, Alhamdulillah, that I was able to endure that. So it's really about the goal and looking at that light at the end of the tunnel, knowing that light, understanding what that light is, desiring it to where when you face that hardship, you think of that light. You say, you know, you know what, I'm going to continue on. So no, knowledge is very important. Knowledge is, is essential. And as a matter of fact, that reminds of course, قَالُوا اللَّهِ تَبَارَكَ وَتَعَالَى إِنَّ مَا يَخْشَى اللَّهَ مِنْ عِبَادِ الْعُلَمَاءِ Those who truly fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala among his servants are those who have the knowledge. The more you know of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the more conscious of him subhanahu wa ta'ala, the more your iman will be stronger and stronger and stronger. And if I may add one more thing in regards to the yaqeen, Shaykh, and talk about yaqeen right now. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, at the beginning of Surah Al-Baqarah, says, Alif la mim, dalik al-kitab la rayba fihi hudan lil muttaqin. This is the book, there's absolutely, has absolutely no doubt in it, is guidance for those muttaqin, those who are righteous, those who are self, or God-conscious people. The first description Allah gave about him is what? Alladina yu'minuna bil ghayb. Those who believe in what? The unseen. What does that exactly mean? Everything about our deen and a, and a great element of it is about the unseen, including, of course, the delayed reward. So how should people really strengthen their iman with that unseen, with the knowledge that Sheikh was talking about, take a responsibility of your action, which we talked about in one of the sessions before, subhanAllah. How can we make sure that our iman and yaqeen is so strong in that delayed reward that will make my journey easy as I go through the hardships? Zakallah khair. Um, SubhanAllah, there's a lot to unpack there, but what is the what is the pleasure of ihsan, of excellence? Excellence, of course, is when you're no longer just doing enough to get by. You're not just fulfilling the obligations, but you're doing the extra, right? Mm. Like, it gets to a point where it's as if you can see Allah Azza wa Jal, right? So it's like, that's a sweetness to it. And that's why the Prophet Sallallahu enjoyed his prayer so much, because it was the salah of ihsan. It was the prayer of ihsan. So it relieved him, alayhi salatu was salam, because ka'annaka tara. You, the, 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 the closer you get to Allah Azza wa Jal, the more real it all becomes to you. And so the easier it becomes to, uh, to deal with these things. And there are a few narrations that come to mind here. One of them uh, is, of course, uh, the narration, and it's it just subhanAllah because it fits the analogy. Uh, you know, the narration of uh, Jabir radiallahu ta'ala anhu and his wife, uh, when they welcomed in the guests of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from the Ansar, and the way that they fooled the kids to put them to sleep, which I guess was a habit at the time of the Arabs, right? They, they only had a little bit of food to feed the guest from the Ansar, uh, or from the poor, the poor person that was brought into their home. And so what does he say to his wife? You know, stir the pot at night until the kids basically go to sleep. So they're smelling the smoke, they're, they're hearing the water, they're hearing, hearing the boiling, and so that's enough for them at some point to be put to ease, so that you can save the little food we have for that guest of the Prophet Wasallam. So sometimes, indeed, what we do on a regular basis, our leisure, our halal leisure, which we're very intentional about, our, you know, our, our breaks, which we're very intentional about, right? That don't undo the progress, but rather keep the, keep the, the worldly element of us uh, taken care of while we continue our pursuit of what is outside of this world. Like, you know, give it its sleep, give it its right. You don't give the body its rights because you worship it. You give the body its right because it's that camel that you need to, to take you into the next place, right? Mm -hmm. So thinking of it that way, my leisure, my, my time. And then subhanAllah, what happens when the pursuit happens? Two things, the appetite shrinks and the goal continues to become more uh, manifest in your life. The appetite shrinks, the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu uh, about the believer who eats with one intestine and, and, and the disbeliever who eats with seven. Uh, that's actually as Ibn Umar ta'ala anhuma, the narration from Ibn Umar anhuma gives us greater context to that. How many of you have heard that hadith before, by the way, this, the, the, the disbeliever eats with seven, the believer eats with one? Okay, so it's, it's a narration that you'll actually see some Islamophobes will make fun of, right? Because like, is the implication that like, when you take shahada, like, <laughs> You know, like it just becomes one stomach, you know, all of a sudden. Did that happen, Shaykh Abdullah, when you took Shahad? Like, like, just all of a sudden, like, just... I don't know, just, know, maybe not. Maybe not, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but like, you know, it's like, is the implication that? No. Uh, Ibn Umar radiallahu anhuma gives the context of this, that there was a man that was just all about his food. 
And so he was drinking laban, drinking milk, and he kept on drinking from like different animals until he finished seven, right? Just going through the milk, the milk, the milk, the milk, the milk. Then once he became Muslim, his appetite shrunk. So he was satisfied with just one. And so it's like the person who has an exam, right? You're not thinking about your food except for the purpose of nourishing you, giving you enough nutrition so that you can continue to focus on your exam, right? You're not going out for, for sushi, you're grabbing a cliff bar, right? You're doing what you've got to do just to get by and to give you the, the, the focus that you need. So your appetite of this world starts to become that way. Your celebrations become toned down a bit. Your, the house that you want, the, the worldly thing you're pursuing, you kind of tone it down a bit because it's enough for the seir, it's enough for the journey. Now the, the gift of this, and I'll end with this, is subhanAllah, and, and this is you know, what the ulama speak about, and it's not to set an unrealistic standard out there, there's the level of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ who in the battlefield actually would say, you know, I can smell Ra'ihatul Jannah. I can smell Jannah. Like I got, I got to that point that I could smell Jannah. You know, there's the person who, who really starts to encounter this. Like uh, as, as uh, Umar radiallahu anhu describes Suhaib al-Rumi radiallahu anhu. It was a beautiful narration. He said, had he not feared Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, lam he still would not disobey him. Like he's fallen in love with Allah to such an extent that even if, even if he didn't fear him, he'd still... He still would not disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because there's a realization there that's taking place. One of the gifts that Allah gives to the believer, when you start reading enough about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and you start immersing yourself in his seerah, immersing yourself in his shama'al, immersing yourself in his sunnah, bringing that as a reality in your life, uh, the beautiful Abu Mustafa in the... In the, in the uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the intro to the Day of Judgment series when he said, I feel like I know him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's a gift that comes over time, right? So when you start thinking about Jannah, you think about the Akhirah enough, and you work for it on a regular basis, it gets to a point like where you, f you start to feel it, you start to sense it, right? Ka'annaka tara, as if you can see it. And so the idea here is to work the reality, uh, to work with that Yaqeen, right? علم اليقين no. until عين اليقين and حق اليقين right so you work with that علم until you have a deeper realization of it and it becomes as if you can see it and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to let that become our reality no. so that it drives us and we can continue to tell the nafs and to tell our worldly appetite just calm down a little bit more there's a better well ahead calm down there's something no. else ahead no that's, that's, that's so beautiful and I always tell myself you know uh, subhanAllah you know when converting to Islam and whether you're someone that was born a Muslim and you saw, you saw the light, right? And you, you, know, you decided to keep moving. Just remember that Ramadan should serve as a catalyst. It should serve as a new beginning. Each and every one of us has a habit. You may say a demon or whatever the case may be that we want to try to suppress. May not be able to eliminate, but suppress that thing. To where Ramadan is a beginning to a new habit. And I say habit because we don't want to just Stop at motivation. Motivation is the beginning. We want to be disciplined. And that's what you have. You have to discipline your nafs. And siyam, there's so much wisdom in siyam. I mean, siyam literally means to withhold yourself from something. In the nadar to the Rahman and and as Maria mentioned, that I made the obligation to have soul and it's from not speaking to anyone. Let in siya, to not to speak to any person. So really prohibiting and withholding yourself for something much greater. It gives you high aspirations. You're prohibiting yourself from something that's even permissible and sometimes obligatory, which is eating and drinking for a much loftier goal. Himmatun Ali, it makes you a person that has high standards. You're holding yourself to high regards. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to be a person that has high standards. And mm -hmm. Ramadan really pushes you to do that. I mean, it's, if you really push yourself, and that's why the anti cap is so beautiful, whether it's in the masters, you're sitting by yourself and thinking, muhasmatunas, holding yourself accountable. You know, the similar Umar al Khattab, muhasmatun fusak, hold yourself accountable before you will be held accountable. Wazimu al qabla al tuzan, and weigh your deeds before they will be weighed. Mm -hmm. So being active about your soul, but being consistent upon it, and you know yourself. That's why, subhanAllah, as you mentioned with the, with the bear, you know, you want that water, you want to, you want to do the sprite, you want to obey your thirst at that time. But you know that, subhanAllah, if I hold myself just a little more, I'll reach a level that I never thought existed within myself. Mm. 
And that's that self-control, self-mastery, that when someone has that, you're un unshakable. So you build basically the spiritual muscles on the way, of course, on that journey. Exactly. exactly. It reminds me with a story. I forgot, subhanAllah, which muhaddith he was, but one of the salaf, rahimahullah, the famous ulama of the hadith. Back in the days, of course, there, when, we, when you talk about knowledge, people, they consider knowledge to be the pursuit of uh, the hadith. I mean, how many hadith have you collected? How many hadith you memorized, you studied? A hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. That was the, the main principle of knowledge back then for them. And in order for people to collect knowledge, it's not like us today, alhamdulillah, you sit from home, and even actually anywhere you are, you can grab your phone and you can find a connection across the, 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 the globe with one of the ulama and the scholars and so on. It was e today is easy to get that knowledge. But back then, in order for them to collect that knowledge, they had to endure a journey, a harsh journey through the desert, the mountains, the weather, and all that stuff just to go and learn a few more ahadith that they heard that one scholar lived in that area, he has them, I don't have them. So one of the ulama of the hadith, uh, he was um, teaching his young son. His son was, you could say, a young boy at the time, and they didn't have a camel or a, or a, or a horse to, to travel by, so they would walk. They would walk from one town to the other one, from one village to the other one, looking for these scholars of hadith to collect the hadith, the knowledge. So the young, the young actually uh, son right now, speaking when he became a great muhaddith afterwards, he goes, my father taught me a lesson in regards to uh, anticipation and waiting and of course, you know, getting for the safeguarding and your energy and so on. He goes, as we were traveling on that journey, my father, he used to ask me to collect some stones, some rocks from the, from the ground. And he said at the time, I have no clue why he asked me to do that for. So I will just listen to my father, I obey him, and I grab these rocks, and I hold them in my hands. And he says, we keep walking. And we walk, we walk, we walk, we walk. And of course, a young boy gets tired, gets exhausted, right? He said, I walk and my father is out ahead of me, and he keeps looking at me. He keeps looking at me. And when I get tired, my hands start cold, kind of dropping down, going down. Then eventually he says, my father then, when he looks at me that I'm getting really tired, he goes, look, he says, uh, drop one of those rocks. Just drop one of them. He goes, when I asked me to drop one of them, I feel I was, oh my God, I freed, completely freed them from slavery in that moment, basically, with them. And then, but still, I still have a few more in my hand. And I walk again. But now I feel the weight is actually, the weight is, is less. And I'm having right now more energy. I'm being energized. Then sometimes later, my father looks at me, I'm getting exhausted. He asked me to drop another one. And then finally, I would have one in my hand. And this one becomes so heavy at some point. Then my father, he asked me actually to drop it. And now that my hands are free, I'm just like, oh. but then he keeps walking and walking and walking and walking until my father sees I'm getting really exhausted. He goes, then he carries me over his shoulder and we start walking like that. He goes, I learned from that example how my father was teaching me to take the, the life one station at a time. You might think it's heavy today, but it's heavier probably in the future. However, if you endure the hardship this time a little bit longer, the reward for it in the future is sweeter. So, Sheikhna, from that point of view, I want to ask this uh, because I might, I don't want people to get the wrong perception from the meaning of really delaying, you know, your reward for it to the extent that now we have absolutely no understanding of worldly pleasure. We can't really enjoy halal entertainment and so on and so on. But at the same time, I don't want people to think that when we ask you to uh, discipline yourself, but then at the same time taking a break, that means we break all the rules. How do we balance this? I want to make sure that I don't want to follow my desires frequently so I can get my reward in the future, inshallah ta'ala. You know, so therefore, I might put myself under so strict uh, system or discipline. But at the same time, I don't want to go the other extreme. Which is basically, since it's okay for me to take a break, then I'll take a real break that might even distract me from my destination. How can we balance between these two things? Allah, subhanAllah, you have to really know yourself and just going through this journey of trying the new things. And throughout that journey, you get to know more about yourself. So, I mean, and knowing your personality, having the friends that are around you that say, look, you're not gonna, for instance, let's talk about fitness real quick and that. Like, you're not gonna be a person that's gonna count your macros, for example. Mm -hmm. You're not gonna count how many carbohydrates if you take, I know you, you're not gonna. But I know that you're, when you're determined to do, you know, a certain thing instead of being very scientific, quote unquote, about it, you'll go out. So having those individuals that are around you that can give you that nosiha about yourself, being honest with yourself, and knowing that you're going to make mistakes throughout the process. No. You're acknowledging that, accepting that, embracing that, to where when you make a mistake or fall short or do something that is not in your best interests, 
you embrace that, accept it, but still you're not looking at the light at the end of the tunnel and saying the majority of the time I'm pushing myself. Mm -hmm. So it's knowing that, and that's the balance. It's knowing that I'm gonna make those mistakes, so I'm gonna fall short. But then when I get back on it, I go a little harder, mm -hmm. right? So I, that's, I think that is the process. And, and it's a process, knowing that it's not something that's just overnight. It's something that is a process. Sheikh, now from your point of view, help us over here as well. What do you suggest in to the brothers and sisters today uh, in regard to this matter? How can we balance this? I think that the main thing is have something that's trackable. Um, if every Ramadan you're at the same square, right, you're back to like, where did I go wrong? What am I doing? Then you have to ask yourself, you know, where is the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu the most beloved of deeds to Allah are the consistent ones, the du'a wa qalb. If you would have just picked up witr, this is a goal, by the way. How about we just set this as a goal for everyone? Witr. <laughs> if you haven't been praying witr regularly, witr from now until next Ramadan. Not the whole eight rak'ahs of tarawih, not the whole, or even isha in the masjid, but just witr, okay? Your one moment, one or three rak'ahs with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala every night. Set something that's trackable, that you can build, that becomes such second nature that you feel as weird leaving it off as if you were to leave one of your fara'ad off. But Shaykh mm -hmm. Yasser spoke about very early on in one of our halaqat, the idea of guarding your fara'at with your nawafid. Okay? Mm -hmm. So that when you miss a nawafid, you're not, when you miss a nafila, you miss a voluntary prayer, you're not sinful. Okay? It's simply, all right, build yourself back up. So stop trying to, you know, uh, build this, this grand, you know, uh, portfolio with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one step at a time, one step at a time, and have something that's trackable, trackable. Fail to plan, then you plan to fail, right? I'm pretty sure I got that from one of your podcasts, right? Fail to plan, plan to fail, right? It's one of them, Sheikh. Mm -hmm. But like, you, you gotta put something ahead of yourself. So small, small things. So just take one or two small things. So that next Ramadan, when you look back at yourself in the night, if Allah gives you life, you say, you know what? Alhamdulillah, those things worked out. That one or two things that I took with me, those habits are still with me today. And inshallah ta'ala, I can persevere. So, I want to add to what we mentioned earlier in regards to safeguarding your fara'ad with your nawafil. So it's really important that you guard your fara'ad with your nawafil. Once again, you start with the, the, the five daily prayers. You need to come out from this month of Ramadan with commitment to one thing, such as the Sheikh was talking about, you know, at least the witr. But if I might push you a little bit further, a little bit more as well, is add the other sunnahs and, and nafil that comes with it. Once again, because if you, if you feel weaker, then you're gonna maybe stop doing some of the sunnah and the nafil, but you will never quit on the fard. But then our ulama, they take a sheikh to the next level. Like they said, sometimes for the righteous person, you should stop uh, or abstain from the mubahat, what is considered permissible. Forget about being na uh, nafil or sunnah. You need, to, you need to abstain from what is permissible so that your nafs, whenever uh, you desire something, it's still within the permissible realm. Otherwise, if you indulge in everything that is halal, just because it's halal, what is left for the nafs when it starts desiring something beyond that? Because your nafs is gonna get bored. You tried everything, all the kind of, you know, mashallah, the, if you go to your, to, your, to your household, all kind of juice and drinks is there, all the halal stuff. You even tried the halal wine and the halal beer, jama'ah. Right, which we tried actually, as a matter of fact. You might want to clarify what you mean by that. <laughs> Halal wine is actually zero <laughs> alcohol, basically. It's a version of wine, but they, they kind of like took the, the, the alcohol out of it. We tried that, subhanAllah. But for me, I was thinking about like, oh my God, what is left then, right? It's so scary. So our ulama, they are teaching us, hey, guard your fara'id with your nawafil. Guard your nawafil with your mubahat, which means you need to discipline yourself to consciously abstain from things that are halal so that when your nafs ever desire something, you still desire something halal. We live in the culture of abundance. We have so much out there that we're never satisfied with anything. So we keep trying new things. We keep trying new things in our culture. We want to try everything in our life. We live in the culture of, of consumerism. Like you want to consume whatever is out there just because I want to feel left out. You see something online, I'm gonna make this. You see one of your friends posted something that they had, you know, they got from the store, oh my God, I wanna try that. You don't have to try it. You don't have to try it. Yes, it's halal, I'm not saying it's haram to go and try it, but you need to discipline yourself that your nafs doesn't have to 
fulfill all its desires just simply because it's halal. Again, we live in a culture that unfortunately, and that's the sad part, we always, always look for an alternative to the haram. When you tell someone, but this is haram, okay, so what do I do? I don't know, that's your business, it's haram, don't do it. <laughs> so we always look for alternative halal. I know the principle of alternative is, 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 is acceptable, it's permissible. But to be honest with you, that's for the average person. Absolutely. For the one who wants to go all the way up there, that's not for you. Absolutely. For you, if it's something haram, سَمِعْنَا وَاطَعْنَا Do you have to do something instead of this? No. Absolutely. But I will go with something not mubah, something mustahab, something far to do. But always finding an alternative for something haram to satisfy my nafs, you're still going downstream. So we don't have to do Halloween. We could just stay home on Love October 31st. Like it's not, not everything has to have. No, I, I think what you just said is very profound, right? Sheikh Abdullah said, don't obey your thirst. You also can't have it your way in this mm. dunya, right? Yeah. You know, so, <laughs> so <laughs> it's, it's, but that's really profound because especially for us in, in the United States, where alhamdulillah, we've been blessed with so much alhamdulillah. and it's easy. And we're always looking for the halal alternative to everything. Yeah. And alhamdulillah, you know, the, the, the realm of halal is so great. It's mubah, right? There's so much that's mubah. Allah Azza wa Jal made the whole garden so that you don't have to go to the one tree. But there are going to be some times that you don't need a tree that looks like the haram tree. No. It's okay. Just sacrifice on this one. Like learn to, to delay your gratification for the akhirah. It's okay. You got to let this one go. There are some things that we're not going to be able to do in this world. And that's okay because we have a greater goal. Allah has given us enough to entertain ourselves with and to, uh, to, to relax the body and to find joy in this life while we search for that ultimate joy. So are you joy saying we cannot life. have a halal Ramadan Christmas tree at home? It depends on the colors. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about the halal. I've never tried the halal wine because I remember one of my... One of my, my teachers was like, when it first like became like a thing, and it's, it's so obvious, it's like it's an inferiority complex, right? Like True. you've got to have the same branding, same colors and everything like that, like we're drinking halal beer. And one of my teachers, he was like, he's, he, was like he, he took one sip of it, and he's like, this is the most disgusting thing I've ever had in my life. <laughs> he, said, he, said, if this, he said, this just gave me more yaqeen <laughs> to never be tempted <laughs> by any of that garbage, any of that stuff that's out there, because that's what the haram tastes like, alhamdulillah, that just gave me like, Full qana'ah, like not to even touch that stuff, right? Like I, this I tell is, you what, you didn't miss much really, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Um, Sheikh, if, is it, I want to call uh, Sheikh Absolutely. Hamza. Absolutely, please, Sheikh. So Sheikh Hamza, uh, Imam Hamza Abdul Malik is here from Memphis. Uh, this is the first Sheikh to recite Quran on Fox News. I'll give the, I'll give the explanation of that. If you remember the Muhammad Ali Janazah, Allah irhamu. Sheikh Hamza was chosen specifically to read at the funeral of Muhammad Ali and I remember not just being there, alhamdulillah, and enjoying his recitation, but also that I was thinking to myself, subhanAllah, here you are reading Qur'an, and it was on Fox News, ESPN, CNN, because Muhammad Ali's janazah, his funeral was being broadcast on every single channel seven years ago. And I remember when, when, you, were, when you were reciting the Qur'an, so alhamdulillah, we're, we're, we're very honored for you to be here, Shaykh. And I want you to just come and you know, share a few minutes, inshallah, ta'ala, your reflections on the subject. Tafadda, Shaykh. No, I'll, I'll, get, I'll get down, I'll get down. it's a blessing, it's an honor to be here with you today, coming all the way from Memphis, Tennessee, uh, to, to see your beautiful faces in Ramadan of all times. Alhamdulillah. Um, just to, you know, uh, you say you wanted me to say a couple words about the subject. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. There was, I mean, there were so many things that you all have already said, uh, uh, mashallah. But what, one of the, when you first mentioned the first story about the men carrying the, uh, the, the logs or the, 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 the tree trunk, it reminded me of um, Imam Zaid Shakir. So I grew up in Imam Zay Shakir's community. I was a, actually, uh, my father converted with, uh, uh, at Imam Zay's hands in, in, in the Air Force. They were in the Air Force together. Um, so he's kind of like my spiritual grandfather, so to speak. So uh, uh, in any case, at our masjid, 
most of the parents were involved with teaching the children how to recite Quran and things like that. But Imam Zaid would come. When he came, he wouldn't really uh, engage in that part of it. He would take us out of the masjid and we would jog around the, the block. Imam Zaid was really big and he's probably still big on jogging. I think he was here and he did this, uh, I think he lifted himself up. It might have been this masjid or another masjid. Does a lot of exercise, mashallah. But when we were, we would jog with him, and he would jog for miles. We wouldn't, we wouldn't jog with him for miles, but in the beginning, we would get tired, and he would, he would sing this, he would do this chant, because he was in the military, and he would do that, you know, to kind of get them through a workout. And uh, the chant went, uh, umi, umi, can't you see? And then we would repeat, umi, umi, can't you see? What Islam has done for me, what Islam has done for me, lift me up and take me straight. And, then we would, and so we would repeat after him. And it was just, and we would get around the block. By the time we got to the end of it, we'd get around the block and, uh, and we would like look forward to those moments of running around the block to read, you know, to, to, to chant that with him. So it reminded me of that. I want you to write the song for us. Inshallah. Absolutely, absolutely. And when Imam, next time Imam Zaid comes, he's gonna, he'll, <laughs> I'm sure he'll be, he'll be pleased to hear it from you all, inshallah. Um, <clears throat> but one of the things that, uh, and we used to look forward to that, and I realized actually just now, when you know, listening to you all speak, is that Imam Zaid wasn't, he wasn't teaching us the formalities of the deen. We had people who were teaching us the formalities but he was teaching us certain realities of the deen. Practicing self-restraint, right? Practicing, uh, doing things, incorporating things in your efforts that allow you to get through to the end. And SubhanAllah, Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala, he does that for us in the Qur'an. Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala says, هُوَ الَّذِي أَنزَلَ السَّكِينَةَ فِي قُلُوبِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala says, he is the one who brings down from above, he brings down that peace and tranquility in the hearts of the believers. Peace and tranquility. The idea of sakina, word sakina uh, comes from this idea of like stillness, peace, serenity. As a matter of fact, in Arabic when we say haraka, the haraka, fetha dhamma sukun, right? These are, these are, or, or, or fetha dhamma kasra, these are harakat. So when you, recite a letter and you, and you put a harakat on it, it's almost like you're moving the sound with the letter. But sukun is when you're still on the letter. And similarly, the, the, the nafs, the ego wants, it wants things. It wants to constantly move. It wants to constantly get things. And actually, it's, it has a good intention, which is that it wants stillness. But it wants stillness by, and it wants tranquility and qana'ah and satisfaction. Because what happens when you're satisfied? You're still. You don't need anything anymore. Ghina, right? Rich in it. But the idea of being rich in Arabic is to mean to not need anything. Right? I don't need anything anymore. The nafs in its primitive state wants things, and it, and it, but it, it, can't, it doesn't have, an, uh, the, the aql doesn't have the knowledge, as you all mentioned, the knowledge that it needs to know what, the, what things it needs in order to not need anything anymore. And so when, we, when we're, we're outside of Ramadan, we're eating and eating and eating. You know, maybe we're eating because we're bored. Maybe we're eating because we're stressed out. Uh, maybe we're eating because we have addiction and just getting rid of it, just eating a little bit will calm us down. Um, but in Ramadan, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, and this is one of the blessings of, uh, 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 it's a bittersweet moment, um, you know, at the end of Ramadan, because on one hand, uh, it's sweet because these are the best times of our lives. Really, when we look back, these are going to be the best times of our lives, being with the believers. Ya ladina amanu taqullaha wa kunu ma'al sadiqeen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, have taqwa of Allah and be among those people of integrity. They'll, those are the moments we'll remember the most, but then at the same time, there's only a few days left of it. Um, and one of the blessings of, of being in Ramadan is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts us through uh, a whole curriculum of sakina, right? A whole curriculum of sakina where, you know, we fast and we fast together 
So it makes it easier for us to fast. We break fast together. Even kids, I was just talking to your son, even kids, my children, uh, they're fasting nine, seven, maybe some of six years old, fasting half the day. You know, they try to fast just because they want to be with the Jemaah. They want to be with everyone. Um, but then that's replaced. That suffering of fast is replaced with a sweetness, halawatul iman, a sweetness of faith, a sakina that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts in our heart. And being a, a, a human being, in Arabic, the word of human being is insan. And insan comes from the word uns. And uns, one of the meanings of uns is sakanul qalb, is to have, is to have a still heart, right? to, to be at peace and to be in tranquility. So after, after fasting all day and eating a little bit, eventually, once we get to Eid, it's difficult to even eat. Right? We, we, it, it becomes more pleasurable to fast than to eat. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala replaces that need for harakah with sukun. Right? And that's the blessing of, 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 of Ramadan. And, uh, and so, you know, alhamdulillah, the, 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 the Muhammad Ali uh, uh, recitation, mashallah. One, one, and I'll just mention one thing about, uh, it was so many things about Muhammad Ali, rahimahullah. But he was planning, he was planning this, uh, this event for years. He had a whole book uh, of notes that he was, you know, that people around him would jot down about things he wanted to do. And one of the things that he wanted to do was he wanted to make sure that the first thing everyone heard was the Qur'an. Mm -hmm. He wanted to make sure the first thing everyone heard, because he knew, he knew his position and he knew that people would be watching. Uh, and, and like one one story, he would go to the to the beach, and he would uh, and he would uh, he would have a bunch of uh, Islamic pamphlets with like you know information about Islam, and he would sign his name on it at the beach, and then he would give them out. So obviously, it's his name, it's his, it's his signature. So people would come from all over the beach to try to grab you know a, a signature that's actually worth money, but he would use that in order to get the message of da'wah out. And even when you go to Louisville, Kentucky, and I recommend you go to his, um, uh, the museum, he has a museum, the first exhibit at the museum is the five pillars. Mm -hmm. You go to the museum and you, I, think, I think you like lay down in some kind of lounge chairs and you look up and it's Salat, Shahada, Zakat, right, uh, SubhanAllah. So he, 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 had that, he had that vision. And Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala also gives us that vision with the blessings of Ramadan a vision that once we have that vision, then it becomes easy to go through whatever we need to go through. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us that, give us that halawa. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us that sakina. Ameen. Ameen. Jazakallah khair. This is a very pleasure also to have you. You want to stay? You're going to stay, inshallah. We're going to have to answer questions, inshallah. Jazakallah khair. It's so sweet and beautiful, heartwarming story, wallahi, that's what you mentioned. SubhanAllah. I got the pleasure, actually, alhamdulillah, to take my young daughter, actually, to go to that museum. And it was very inspiring, you know, subhanAllah, just to look at these things, unbelievable. A man who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put him in a certain position in life, and he utilized that energy and that fame, not for himself, but to propagate the da'wah and the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah use this all for this purpose, Ya Rabbil Alameen. So we're going to take, inshallah, questions right now. I don't know where the microphone is. Bismillah. Uh, and the brothers and sisters, if you guys have already uh, asked questions before, we suggest to give it to someone who didn't ask a question, inshallah. Because we have about maybe 15 minutes to finish, inshallah. There's a hand over there, too. Go ahead. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, uh, it's good to see you again, uh, Sheikh uh, Hamza. Barakallah uh, I have a question for the Mashaykh. Uh, as far as the taqwiyat uh, and nafs uh, seem to be more of a more of a mental toughness than anything else. How do you see some of the uh, the turuq as sufiyah uh, does it have any role in taqwiyat yeah, no, al-nafs? Uh, well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, oh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he established the dimensions of the religion in, in hadith of Jibril. In hadith of Jibril, we have Islam, which is more of the formalities, the aspects of physical things that we do. And we have Iman, the beliefs, the thing that we have to believe in uh, in terms of the unseen realm. And then we have Ihsan, which is really combining both the outward and the inward. 
so that we can actually have the haqiqa, which is the reality, to actually understand the reality of what we're doing, right? To actually worship Allah. So you can be doing your salat, and you can believe in Allah, and you can believe that you're praying to Allah, but how are you praying? Like, what benefit are you getting from your prayer? Are you worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as if you see him? Or are you at a different level, at a, at a lower level where, where, where you're praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or you're worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as if he sees you? That's a science in and of itself. Ilm as the scholars say, that it, it, you know, the, the terminologies aren't as important as the realities. So on one hand, the Turuq al-Sufiyya, one way to look at them is um, the, uh, the different madhahib on how to attain those levels of yaqeen, those levels of certainty with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just like you have madhahib in fiqh or, uh, or you know, discourses in, 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 in aqidah as well. Um, and with everything, there are boundaries and there are extremes and things like that. that you, and so you have to have principles. You have to be following the sharia. You, have to, you, know, you can't deviate from aqidah. Uh, in any of your, in any of your uh, beliefs. So they all go together, and they also say that the fourth dimension is alama tusa'a and understanding the time that you live in. Zat understanding the time. So, question here? Yes, Salaamu Alaikum wa rahmatullah. I don't have a question. I have a request to Qari Sahib if he can recite some of the surah, what he recited in uh, Muhammad Ali's janaza. Please. Thank you so much. Jazakumullah. Sure, we can do that, inshallah. Sheikh, you want to answer the question, you're right? Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's not a Okay. Because uh, I, have a ve- sorry, I have a very, a very pressing question for Sheikh Uduro. How much do you bench? <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to answer this? <laughs> Come on, man. Give him the pleasure of the answer, please. Just tell him, tell him as much as I As much as he does. <laughs> of course, of course. It's like Allah khair. But seriously, Sheikh, if you want to give an advice on this matter, what would it be? Bench, bench, pressing. bench pressing, yeah. Um, <laughs> don't bench press. I don't bench press. I don't use the bar. I, I do push-ups, weighted push-ups, angle push-ups, dips. Uh, a lot of a lot of uh, body weight training. You get a belt and add plates to it. And do it in different angles. It's the most important thing. So I don't have to go to the gym for this, right? You don't have to go to the gym for that. No. Thank sir. you. Zakallah khair. Alhamdulillah. Okay. Let's get from the sisters. Oh, from of the brother. Okay, I'll get you. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Um, when you were talking about abstaining from something permissible to strengthen your nafs, it reminded me of in uh, Surah Baqarah when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about the army that's on their way to fight Jalut. True. Can you elaborate on that and how, how they benefited from that, from abstaining from the water? Do you want to take this one? The story basically, when we say that, abstain from the, from the mubah, mm. to strengthen your nafs. So the story when uh, Bani Israel, they went on the journey to fight, and they were asked not to drink from the river, even though drinking from the water is something halal. Mm. How can we relate that to this concept? It's about sabr, it's about patience. So uh, in, in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَلَمَّا فَصَلَ طَالُوتُ بِالْجُنُودِ قَالَ إِنَّ اللَّهَ مُبْتَلِيكُمْ بِنَهَرِ So when, when Talut and his army reach this, this river, Talut tells them what the situation is. This is a test. Right? This is going to be a test for you. Your nafs wants that sakina. Your nafs wants that, you know, that, that kind of satisfaction of drinking the water. But we have a higher purpose here. And that higher purpose requires a higher level of discipline than the normal kind of discipline that we usually have. And so he tests them and he, and he, and he says, Inna Allah mubtalikum binhar. Not Talud. This isn't Talud's test that he's giving. He's telling the people that this is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to put you through. And, uh, and, he, and he says that basically you shouldn't drink from it at all. But if you do, and this is where we get to the idea of like abstaining from the halal. So even if you do, you should do a little bit, not a lot. Don't drink more than, 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 than you know, basically a little cup of water. Um, but even that, he kind of discouraged them by not putting that first. 
فَمَنْ شَرِبَ مِنْهُ فَلَيْسَ مِنِّي He says, whoever drinks from it, you're not from me. So he kind of, pref- he kind of gave that preference to him. And then he said, وَمَنْ لَمْ يَطَعْمُهُ فَإِنَّهُ مِنِّي إِلَّا مَنْ اِغْتَرَفَ غُرْفَةً بِيَدِي Except for, for the one who drinks, you know, uh, a little bit. فَشَرِبُوا مِنْهُ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا مِنْهُمْ So all of them drank from it, except for a few of them. The result of that, so what happened? Nothing happened, they drank and that was it. But the test, the, the test revealed something about them. فَلَمَّا جَاوَزَهُ هُوَ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مَعَهُ So then when they went past that, that test and they reached the, the battlefield, قَالُوا All those people who drank who didn't have that self-discipline, they didn't have self-discipline with, the, with, with water. And how much dis- discipline are they going to have with Jalut? and his army. <laughs> they, can't, they, they can't abstain, they don't have the grit to stay away from water, then they're, then they're going to run from the battlefield, which is what, what they, we don't have the energy, we can't, we can't, we can't fight. So there are a few traits that these people had, the people who stayed with Talut. Um, Number one, they actually believed that they were going to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they had a level of certainty that And they had optimism. They had the discipline, they had, they had the perspective, and they also had optimism. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, said, they, they said, look at how many uh, uh, small armies have defeated great armies by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the second thing is to have optimism and know that if you're doing something right according to the sharia and aqidah and the ihsan, with the level of ihsan, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will have rahmah on you. Inna rahmatallahi qareebun min al muhsinin. The mercy of Allah is close to the believers or to, to the people of ihsan. And the word rahmah here is actually written different, differently than in other places, the rahmah is with the tab of tuha. So open, open tab, not the tab uh, uh, you know, marbuta, meaning that it's, 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 it's extended extra for the people of Ihsan. Um, uh, and so the, these are some of the lessons that you can gain from <laughs> that. I have a question here that related to a subject we talked about yesterday, uh, saying that um, how does one reach, a, um, reach and refrain like you reach and retain the constant state of gratitude and shukr, regardless of circumstances. I think this question is referring to what we talked about yesterday. Um, we said, look, when it comes to dealing with hardships and difficulties, people's response to them is one of four things, as Ibn Qayyim read on his teach from his teacher, Sheikh Ibn bin Taymiyyah. Because the first level is tasakhut. People, people, they show displeasure, and that's haram. The second state is people show patience. Uh, which means they are not going to say anything bad, they're not going to do anything bad, but they will abstain from objecting it physically, but they're not satisfied within their hearts. The third level, and that's wajib, that's their obligation, to be patient. The third one is to have rida, which means to be content. Yes, it's a trial, it's difficult, it's hardship, and I'm going to abstain from saying something wrong, but at the same time, I'm pleased with Allah's judgment. However, I stop there. And the best way of reacting towards these things is to show shukr, like seeing where is the ni'mah in this misery, where is the ni'mah in this trial. So the question is, how can we maintain this level of gratitude regardless of these circumstances? And how can we make sure that we always at that level of, yani, of the highest level of response to these trials and, and miseries? <coughs> Inshallah. Uh, SubhanAllah, I mean, even, even the things that you, even the, the levels that were mentioned, um, we, we have to acknowledge that, that at, one, at some level, at, at least in the beginning, there will be sabr, right? You, we have to have a certain level of sabr. Once we are, but the key thing is, once we have that sabr and the sakina comes, then it becomes a lot easier to have rida. Liyazdadu, because at the end of the, of the, once you get past the sakina, waladi anzala sakina tafi qulub al mu'minin. Liyazdadu imanan ma'a imanihim. So, for one, they already had some iman. That, that, that first level of iman allows them not to be angry with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, they didn't have that. They at least, they at least had the right perspective where they realized, okay, this is going to be a test. 
I know there's a, you know, a, a greater purpose, and they, and they you know, clench their teeth, and they try to move forward. But then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala replaces that with a level of iman, halawa, a level of sweetness of iman, and then it, it, it enters into their heart. That enables them to move, the, because right when they get to that point where they think they're going to give up, right? حَتَّى يَقُولَ الرَّسُولُ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مَعَهُ مَتَى نَصْرُ اللَّهُ it's at that point, once the, people, once the people say, when is the help of Allah what, coming? At that point, Allah, inna nasrallahi qareeb. It's very close at that point. It's very close at that point. That's why in Ramadan, uh, and you know, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept our, our fast and our, and our worship. In Ramadan, where Allah, uh, uh, in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قريب, uh, w- uh, When my servants ask uh, about me, then I am near. Those ayat are in the context of Ramadan. Because in, the, in the, a few ayat before that, شَهْرُ رَمَضَانِ الَّذِي أُنزِلَ فِيهِ الْقُرْآنِ هُدَى لِلنَّاسِ وَبَيِّنَاتِ مِنَ الْهُدَى وَالْفُرْقَانِ and so on and so forth. Um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is closest to us in those moments. And so once we break through that, if we just go one inch Beyond that, one inch, you know, you got that one more rep that you, that you need. That's where all the muscles being built, right there. Once you get past that one inch, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you an opening. And that, when you get that opening, يَزْدَادُ إِيمَانًا مَعَ إِيمَانِهِمْ You get that, that, that new found faith, and then shukr comes as a result of that. Gratitude, because now you've tasted the sweetness, and you want more. So you want to go another round. You wait till those muscles, you know, get, stop getting sore, do your eat, you come back, and you want to do another round and another round. That's how the Sahaba were, radiallahu anhum. You know, they were asked the Prophet sallallahu is this is all I need to do, and I'll get Jannah? Or one of them would say, I smell Jannah, and they would, they would go, and they would do whatever the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa told them to do, because they had, that, they had that taste. So seek out that taste in Ramadan before Ramadan ends. Seek out that iftar. Of, of your sabr, the spiritual one, uh, before, before the fast ends uh, at the end of Ramadan. Wallahu a'lam. Barakallahu alaykum, Shaykh. Alhamdulillah. Fine. Yeah, inshaAllah. A'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajeem. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الذين قالوا ربنا الله ثم استقاموا ثم استقاموا تتنزل عليهم الملائكة ألا تخافوا ألا تخافوا ولا تحزنوا وأبشروا بالجنة وَأَبْشِرُوا بِالْجَنَّةِ الَّتِي كُنْتُمْ تُوْعَدُونَ نَحْنُ أَوْلِيَاؤُكُمْ فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ وَلَكُمْ فِيهَا مَا تَشْتَهِي أَنفُسُكُمْ وَلَكُمْ فِيهَا مَا تَدَّعُونَ نُزُلًا مِنْ غَفُورٍ رَّحِيمٍ وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ قَوْلًا دعا إلى الله وعمل صالحا وعمل صالحا وقال إنني من المسلمين 
ولا تستوي الحسنة ولا السيئة ادفع بالتي هي أحسن فإذا الذي بينك وبينه عداوة كأنه ولي حميم وما يلقاها إلا الذين صبروا وما يلقاها إلا ذو حظ عظيم صدق الله العظيم أحسنتم الله خير بارك الله فيكم We apologize for not having more questions inshallah ta'ala We'll see you inshallah at 3 a.m. بإذن الله فوضى تهجد جزاكم الله خير I want to thank our guest Sheikh Khalid We're here Sheikh Abdullah Sheikh Umar بارك الله فيكم جزاكم الله خير السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته